Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth discussion in our webinar series about how drug policy intersects with COVID-19. We are so thrilled to have you with us um, to discuss today um, harm reduction and health um, and trends um, with respect to COVID-19. Um, we are so thrilled to have you with us. This is going to be a 90-minute panel discussion, and then we are going to transition to the Q&A portion of the call. Um, so we certainly invite you to join the conversation by leaving comments in the chat box um, and also clicking on Q&A um, if you have a speaker question. Um, both of those buttons can be found on the bottom of your screen. Um, and also, definitely don't forget to tweet any comments or discussion um, that you find particularly thought-provoking or important. Um, our hashtag for this entire series um, is hashtag COVID, DPA COVID series. Um, with that, I would love to introduce our esteemed panel. Um, I am going to have them introduce themselves. Um, and we are having one panelist that we are just getting um, secured with audio. So Jamie, why don't I start with you? Hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Favero. I'm the founder and the executive director of Next Harm Reduction, um, also known as Next Distro on social media. We run two platforms, both are online and mail based. Uh, Next Distro is an online and mail based needle exchange program, and Naloxone for All.org is an online and mail based naloxone distribution platform. Um, we operate in all 50 states. I should say we, we've delivered to all 50 states and uh, across 40% of US counties. We operate in 31 states with the help of state-specific affiliate programs. Thank you so much. Ms. Ian. Hi, Ms. Ian. Um, currently the executive director of the San Francisco Drug Users Union, which is a needle exchange, a drop-in center, a Narcan uh, distribution and training center. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, we're sort of a ground floor, tenderloin neighborhood of San Francisco, if you know anything about the neighborhood. And then um, what else would I say? I guess we sort of like, um, we specialize in uh hiring and training and retaining employees who um have lots of lived experience of both homelessness and drug use and um i would say like like the majority of the employees that work here are currently active drug users um and so yeah i also think we over the last few years we sort of prided ourselves in creating a system that um hires from our population and um, sets, the, sets us up for success. Um, that's it. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for joining us. Um, Dr. Andrea Lopez. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrea Lopez. Um, I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, um, but I have about two decades of working in harm reduction. Either I started out in direct service work as an outreach worker um, at a needle exchange and then later transitioned into becoming a harm reduction researcher. Um, so now I really see myself as positioned as a person who tries to work around communities that have been impacted by the war on drugs to really um, kind of assert that people's lived experience is just as important to the evidence base as the kind of scientific variables that scientists measure from a distance. Um, also see myself as doing harm reduction kind of from within one of the bellies of the many beasts that we kind of confront these days, which is academia and research. Um, and so really thinking about ways in which we can transform some of the harms that have been committed by research um, and thinking through trauma-informed, collaborative, and community-based uh, research. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Dr. Hansel Tuk. So uh, my name is Hansel Tooks. I am assistant professor of medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. When I was a medical student, I began, began advocating for harm reduction services in the state of Florida. And we were able to pass uh, legislation when I was a resident that authorized the first uh, legal syringe services program in Florida. Uh, since then, I've, I've turned into a professor and I've mentored a, a new generation of students in advocacy. And, 
and they have uh, successfully advocated for syringe services to be legal in the entire state. Uh, all of my research is, uh, in turn, is in involving harm reduction. I, I run the harm reduction research group, and it's all about low barrier care for people who uh, inject drugs. And then all of my teaching is all about teaching med students to treat people who use drugs with uh, respect and compassion. And actually, the University of Miami put me in charge of the substance use disorder curriculum, which has been an honor, and we're really changing the way that the future physicians practice medicine. So. Um, that's basically what we're doing down here in Miami. Thank you so much. And Jesse Lee, have we got your audio worked out? I'll ask you to introduce yourself. I think so. Can can y'all hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. So my name is Jesse Lee Dunlap, and I work in Haywood County doing jail-based overdose prevention as well as mobile syringe access. And uh, a lot, I'll say pretty much everything that I learned about harm reduction was from Phil Brown of the Study Collective. And uh, my interest in that stems from just being like a queer person and not fitting in and having a great sympathy and empathy for people who use drugs because I experienced that a lot. And um, since joining the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition in this position, my coworker Gary and Yoakum, who I think is in the audience, but should really be um, here instead of me being here, she's taught me everything else that I know about um, harm reduction. And um, so, in in addition to like the, you know the 40-hour work week or whatever, it's just a non-stop like advocacy situation out here in the rural rural Western North Carolina. We're just west of Asheville, so that's. That's what I want to do as well. Thank you so much. Well, we're so glad that you could join us um, and thank you to all of the panel. I want to start out by um, talking about a disturbing trend. Of course, prior to COVID hitting, we know that we were in the worst public health crisis of our time um, with increasing and unrelenting um, rates of overdose death. Um, but that really seems to have been compounded, right, in this moment. And we're seeing um, various reports, um, anecdotal and otherwise, um, around the country of increasing overdoses in the context of COVID. Um, so I first want to talk, turn it over to um, Dr. Lopez to just kind of contextualize um, some of the factors that might be underlying this trend um, in terms of what compounded um, vulnerabilities might look like right now. And then I'd like to open it up um, to the rest of our panelists to talk about whether or not this is something that you're seeing um, in your respective jurisdictions and what your understanding is of kind of some of the underlying um, causes and factors. So Dr. Lopez? Sure. Um, so again, I'm just going to start out sort of broadly by framing um, COVID within sort of the larger landscape of health inequities more broadly. And so I think no one better than people working at the front lines in harm reduction knows that COVID is really part of this kind of legacy of violence that has impacted our communities. Um, you know, in particular marginalized people who use drugs, but also Black and Latinx communities at this moment. So really part of this broader dynamic of the way in which certain communities are always sort of subject to compounded vulnerabilities. Um, so it makes sense that these epidemics in some ways, if we think about COVID and overdose death, would kind of immediately kind of intertwine um, and entrench themselves and actually enhance each other's um, sort of severity. Um, one other thing I sort of wanted to mention kind of within the context of this is that, um, you know, what a lot of people have been sort of observing and describing is that, you know, we're sort of contending with the reality of you know, as these sort of issues are all deeply intertwined in terms of our sort of uh, process of racialized health inequities in the US, you know, there's also a lot of sort of reflection on what it means to watch institutions sort of immediately react. Um, so this idea of really grappling with the idea that there was always sort of money and resources, um, but that continually people have sort of been forced to endure a position where their lives were less worthy uh, to intervene upon than other lives. Um, and so really coming back to thinking about at this moment, you know, people are sort of fighting at the front lines to address issues of COVID, um, but also sort of managing the kind of trauma that comes from 
sort of witnessing governments and health departments mobilize around a health emergency um, and oftentimes recognizing that it took you know decades and years of suffering and frontline work um, to get people to recognize overdose death in the same way um, so again thinking about the ways in which these are sort of all intertwined kind of epidemics in relationship to health disparities as they play out um, racial inequities in healthcare, um, and these are all sort of compounded epidemics Thank you so much. Um, and Ms. Ian, um, how is this playing out in an urban environment um, like San Francisco and specifically a neighborhood like the Tenderloin, which um, has had challenges um, over the years in terms of overdose stuff, but now we see those compounded um, with COVID. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing um, with the population that you work with? Yeah, absolutely. Um... So for people who don't know, the Tenderloin is this really interesting neighborhood in San Francisco that is, um, <clears throat> it is a lower income neighborhood that with, it's like a lot of families, there is a lot of older people. It's got a lot of really rich history in, in sort of like lower class, different marginalized groups, activist rights type of stuff. And um, yeah, I won't go full into it, but <clears throat> it's also, right downtown so the tenderloin is like a lower income neighborhood like smushed right up against our like our tourist and like big shopping district areas for downtown and so it uh it is this really it's just a really interesting vibe and i don't think i don't even think neighborhoods like this exist in cities in america anymore um so when covid19 hit lots of the people who live in the Tenderloin have lots of sort of informal hustles that get them by um, from week to week, right? But a lot of those involve like panhandling, uh, busking, which is like playing music outside and, and you know, having a hat out to collect donations. Um, there is like petty thievery because our neighborhood is also like right next to uh, a very large mall um, and uh, I guess there's like lots of stores uh, really close for it that lots of uh, people who live in the Tenderloin have found an easy way of sort of um, stealing different things like clothes and I don't know, stuff and then selling them in the neighborhood in different areas, um, uh, especially at pawn shops and stuff. And so all of those things have closed. So like the mall is closed, a lot of those stores are closed, nobody's outside, you cannot do busking, you cannot do uh, even panhandling, um, and the pawn shops are closed. And so what, what I guess I didn't realize when this thing first started was that there, uh, I was burning out fast because a lot of my job turned into de-escalating fights. So people were upset, they do not have money, they cannot, um, they cannot afford their, their whatever daily stuff that they need, but also um, substances, right? So lots of people are very dope sick. They're um, starting fights with people who are their friends and their family members. They, um, and they're not, the other part of this is that a lot of things like uh, groups, like a lot of times people's like a therapy or informal therapy or even regular therapy that um, if they don't have access to a phone, they can't do their therapy anymore, right? And um, stuff like regular groups, like there's a lot of groups out here in this neighborhood for people who use substances, but also for people who are trans, um, who mostly are isolated to begin with and that their, their big outing um, or social moment was like their, their group where they got to hang out with other trans people once a week and like all of that stuff has stopped. So isolation is way up, um, uh, I don't know, like anger and elevated sort of like, um, what do you call it, sporadic sort of chaotic uh, episodes are happening more and more often. And um, it has been turbulent to say the least. There's a lot of, there's, uh, I don't know, people are, are doing okay, uh, but it has been, it's been very intense um, on those levels. And so, <clears throat> I can't remember, was that, were you just asking like what it looks like? That's sort of what it's looked like. Yeah, it's been that's sort of like waves of, of, of that. But um, yeah, it took me a minute to realize how many of those things had ended. And I, I'm not even really sure if the people, like our participants and members and, and, and neighborhood or our neighbors even realized that they weren't 
doing these things that they need for basic like mental health and that they were reacting to it without thinking about why it, they didn't feel healthy anymore. And it also took me a minute. So um, yeah, we're, we're even still working on like what are best ways to move forward because we had it, we didn't predict that or we didn't think about it. Sure. I think, you know, you're talking to a really important real life example of what Dr. Lopez was talking about with compounded um, vulnerabilities because it is so layered. And I think so many people in the context of COVID think, okay, well, sure, like there's heightened risk of overdose because people have less access um, to naloxone because then, but it really is all these underlying layers around disrupted markets and isolation um, and informal economies that have been totally disrupted. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, we are going to be having a webinar conversation specifically about informal economies in the context of COVID, mm -hmm. that's in two weeks. Um, cool. So please return back and join that conversation with us as we dig um, more deeply into those um, issues. But I'm gonna switch to another, um, more urban environment on the other side of the country um, to Miami and um, see Hansel if this is something that um, is resonating with you or um, specific factors that you've seen in the population that that you're serving that is contributing to um, increased risk um, of a whole host of harms during this time. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'm in the epicenter of uh, the COVID epidemic now, unfortunately. Um, but even back in March, uh, there was some one thing that was clear. I, I went into harm reduction because it's uh, the practice of medicine that's like rooted in kindness. And back in March, we immediately saw that harm reduction would never be practiced the same way as it had been. So we had to make really tough decisions at the Idea Exchange, which is our our program here in Miami. And you know, there's no longer a place to drop in and sit down. You have to do exchange through a window. We suspended HIV and Hep C testing for for months, uh, and then so in uh, looking at the service changes that we were going to make, we started calling programs around the country. Probably called some of you, and we we recently published a paper. I mean, the harm reduction services were curtailed severely uh, during COVID, and the thing that is the core of harm reduction and why it's it's such a privilege to to teach. Uh, medical students about the fundamental principles of harm reduction is that we forget how far the smile and the hug and the touch and all of the things that we uh, previously were able to do with the people that we love and serve, like all of that has been taken away from us. Uh, we, our patients can't see our faces when I'm in the hospital. Um, and just the way that my team has to practice harm reduction now through a window uh, or through the window of the mobile unit and behind a mask. So I think that there has been, I mean, we were the first people um, largely in Miami that made these changes because I actually read, which most people may not do here. And, uh, you know, I think that the people that we serve, uh, I saw, especially with a lot of my patients, people who worked in tattoo shops, people who worked in, in bars, restaurants, even people who were on buprenorphine, you know, as they lost their jobs and they, they lost their, their, their source of income, a lot of people lost their housing. And the number of my patients who have uh, returned to drug use who were previously on, uh, on buprenorphine, it's, uh, there have been a lot of stressors. And uh, compounded on top of that, we have the instability in the drug supply. I mean, the borders were shut. I, I live right near Miami International Airport. We usually see planes every two seconds. The, there are barely any planes in the sky. I feel like I'm in Havana. And it's, um, the drug supply is definitely not the same. It's not of the same quality. It's not of the same quantity. And I think that that's how we're seeing these, these surges in overdose. To the credit of the people in the law enforcement realm, uh, they stopped doing drug arrests in Miami for, for months. We actually had the longest stretch of time without any murders in Miami, which was remarkable. Uh, and there was an effort to do to decarcerate, so to release people from jail. But they just released people from jail, many of whom we all know are in there for substance use disorder, so for for uh, you know reasons that they shouldn't be there. And there was no was, you know, people had been in there 21 plus days, and of course, as the same story that we always have, they had lost their tolerance and and people overdosed. So, you know, the problem with COVID is that. When we got people to pay attention to the overdose epidemic eventually, but then COVID was something that everybody could get. And 
the people that we serve have been completely ignored and completely left behind. Like nobody cares about the people that we serve right now. And it is so important for us to make sure that we focus on and uplift our community because, uh, you know, this is going to go on for, for months. And uh, unfortunately, harm reduction, as, as we all know it and came to love it, will never be the same. Thank you. And thank you for pointing out that it's not just people who are currently using who may be at increased risk, but also people who are um, stabilized on medications or otherwise in recovery um, that are feeling these stressors as well and maybe returning to use um, in, in ways that could be um, dangerous to their health. Um, Jesse Lee, I want to turn it over to you, um, particularly because you are working in a rural context um, to see, you know, what has resonated with you or what some differences might be in terms of um, what you're seeing in North Carolina. I think you're still on mute, actually. Okay, can y'all hear me now? Sorry, I'm going back between the computer and the phone. Can y'all hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so, mobile syringe access is how we primarily get supplies to folks. We have we have a for surprisingly enough for like this far western North Carolina county, we have a really good relationship with our health department, the Department of Health and Human Services here. So that they offer six access we just leave like pre-made supply bags that people can just come in and ask for and uh so but our mobile syringe access has just continued on we just do no contact drops as much as possible and like hansel said like that like hug or that smile or that whatever you know all those little things for our people like mean so much and that's that's one thing i try to impre impress upon like our community community members that are I think um, opposed to harm reduction is that like y'all don't even understand like if you just go just the tiniest bit out of your way like these people these folks that we work with are so grateful and just like it changes their lives so having that like not being able to make that contact is um, like detrimental to this work but the other but we've still been able to provide services for you know nonstop. So um, except for the half of my job that's the jail based overdose prevention here. Um, that that stops mid March. And there's no there's no word as far as like that being able to be continued. So I did re just recently ask the uh, jail folk, the, the detention center here if we could just instead of meeting the whole like meeting with folks and leaving the lock zone packets in their belongings as they leave to just go ahead and everybody that's in there now which is a lower population because just like everybody else we've kind of like decarcerated if they don't have to be in there our detention center does not want folks in there so um like tomorrow morning i'm going to drop off the lock zone kit and contact information for all of our services to be put in everyone's possessions when they leave so that's that's a good thing that's happening. Um, that's the, that's the big change is like not being able to just like make that personal connection as much with folks, and the and not being able to get into the jail, which is huge because like um, someone else already mentioned, folks coming out of the jail, like there were a lot of folks that I was told that I work with, I was trying to get out of jail before COVID ever hit us. And it was like, no, their charges are so steep, they will never get out. And I'm like, well, I really need you as their lawyer to contact me if there's any possibility that, that they're going to get out because they have no resources and I need to like go get them when they come out. And there's been instances where like, you know, someone with severe substance use disorder is released after hours and no contact from their lawyer that I've been, uh, you know, steadily in touch with to make sure this doesn't happen and this happens anyway. So. Thank you so much. And a few of you have met, mentioned working with um, incarcerated populations. And I, I think it's so important for those of you who are interested, we previously had a um, webinar on reentry and you can access that recording um, if you want to listen to that. But, you know, ultimately it's so important that um, harm reduction and reentry services be integrated, particularly as people are leaving and that, you know, DPA has been working a lot 
uh, and a lot of advocacy around um, the CDC, um, who's making health recommendations, but doesn't include decarceration as one of those um, health recommendations. And so what do we need to decarcerate, but then also to provide harm reduction and services to people who are being released um, with very little support? Um, so many of you kind of touched on um, what the specific challenges are right now and, and how you've adapted, but I want to dive a little bit more deeply into the ways in which your programs um, have adapted and can and should continue to evolve as we learn more. Um, but I first want to start this, this question um, with Jamie, because, you know, next to show is a very unique model that, of course, was in existence prior to COVID, but to me plays a really important role in this moment in filling the gap um, where there is a lack of services, um, either because of location or jurisdiction um, or COVID shutdowns. So I'm just wondering, Jamie, if you could provide us a little bit more information on your program and how you, you know, see it filling the gap right now in terms of service provision. Sure. So Next Distro, who is inspired by the work of Tracy Hilton, is an online and mail-based exchange. The idea is, how can we support people who use drugs that can't access in-person resources um, with supplies, education, resources, and support? And I've um, been working in drug service since 2001, and I know how important that hug and that touch and that smile is to people and feel really strongly that mail-based service delivery is like, um, you know, a last ditch option. It's for people that really can't access in-person resources. And with COVID-19, it's been really difficult because generally um, when someone approaches us um, because they found us on Google or Reddit, or through social media, we always try and divert people into in-person service. So if someone lives within the vicinity of a harm reduction program, we'll connect them with the in-person program. Um, it's our goal never to take people out of in-person service, but to connect them with resources in their community. And with COVID-19, so many uh, syringe exchange programs ac across the country were shuttered. And it wasn't the grassroots harm reduction programs. It was not the needle exchange programs run by people who use drugs. It was the health departments. It was the large ASO organizations where harm reduction wasn't in their mission. Um, and it, it's been really difficult um, because the programs that are run by people who use drugs and run, you know, uh, grass like grassroots activist programs are the ones that are struggling the most with funding. Um, I was recently on a R Corp webinar and um, someone asked if stigma was a reasonable reason to not access naloxone in a pharmacy. And I feel like if you have any concept of what it's like to live in a rural community where everyone knows your business, then stigma absolutely affects your ability to access re traditional resources in your neighborhood. Um, so there's a lot of things that interplay here. It's frustrating because all of these uh, health department programs and large, large community-based programs that are not harm reduction specific have closed and those are the ones receiving funding whereas the small grassroots harm reduction programs are the ones that are really pushing through and coming up with some majorly innovative strategies to continue to provide services to people who use drugs and even to expand their services. Um, I know a program that was super underfunded and they're open a few hours a week. But when COVID-19 hit, they changed their entire model to be a four day a week appointment based syringe access program. And they, you know, quadrupled their um, ability to provide syringe access. Um, one other thing we've been seeing is that people who uh, receive, people who access syringes in communities where syringes are not available through pharmacies, perhaps they're getting them at veterinary supply stores. Those, those supply options are also closing. So we're seeing such an intense level of syringe scarcity. Um, I'm sure like you all, I'm so concerned about what this is gonna look like for public health in the next few months and years. Thank you so much, Jamie. I think it's a really important theme around the co-optation, which seems to happen so often in public health crises in the context you know, of the overdose crisis more broadly, 
Um, and naloxone distribution, for instance, you know, you have a significant portion of the, you know, federal and other funds going to law enforcement based naloxone distribution instead of the community based organizations that we know are most connected to the real first responders, which are people who use drugs. In the context of COVID, um, you have um, these more formalized systems departments or health or otherwise that are stepping in but aren't fundamentally connected um, to the communities or to the principles of harm reduction um, that are often getting the funding um, and, um, and the resources. Um, I wonder, um, Hansel, you had mentioned earlier that harm reduction will never be the same. And so I wanna ask um, you and Andrea to talk a little bit about um, what it might look like in the future. And are there research questions that we need to be asking ourselves now um, to better evolve our harm reduction programs um, and to better tailor them to a, a COVID, you know, a, a future with as COVID as a reality. Yeah, so we were very fortunate at IDEA. Uh, so I'm an HIV physician. Uh, so I do HIV primary care and I also do the inpatient HIV service at our public teaching hospital. We were very fortunate that we had already asked the question of how we can best deliver care to people who use drugs. People in the healthcare system, the stigma is so intransigent that I came to a place where I had no hope in the fact that those things would change. But I knew that if we trained a new generation to treat people differently, uh, things would change in the future. But in the meantime, how would we most effectively deliver care to people who use drugs and treat them with the respect and dignity uh, that they deserve and also meet them on their own terms. And so being uh, on the younger side of, of uh, an academic physician, I really looked at the use of technology, lever leveraging technology. And it is really amazing uh, using telehealth to, to deliver care. Um, people in my division and students who I've been teaching telehealth have been really amazed at this sort of on-demand system of HIV care. And that also applies to medications for opioid use disorder. We've developed this uh, online platform where somebody can come in, request uh, a buprenorphine consultation, and the students evaluate the patient via Zoom or FaceTime. If people don't have access to technology, they can use our iPads and our Wi-Fi uh, at the exchange. And we are able, with the, the relaxing of the buprenorphine prescription rules, we've been able to start a lot of people on buprenorphine. We've been able to engage a lot of people in HIV care. And I do think that COVID, the one good thing that probably happened is that we've greatly uh, accelerated this timeline for, for use of technology to, to reach people uh, who, uh, for many reasons and justified reasons, do not uh, prefer to enter the traditional healthcare system. And we've also had a, a reduction in these man-made barriers to access to antiretrovirals and man-made barriers to access to buprenorphine. You know, why do I need to get a urine drug screen on somebody in the middle of a pandemic to get a Medicaid authorization for somebody who's been on buprenorphine for, for six months, even if they've only been on it for two weeks? I mean, so we've really been fighting and advocating uh, and just stripping away all of these barriers. And I am hopeful, but uh, guardedly hopeful that we'll be able to continue to deliver care in this manner. And I, I do feel that the the next era of harm reduction will will use a lot of, of, there will be a lot of this, which is just so weird to think about. Um, but it is a way for us to remain connected. And even though I'm in my apartment and many times my team is out somewhere in the community, maybe um, anywhere outside, and I'm able to connect with people who uh, I haven't seen in a few weeks and, and uh, talk to them about their concerns and and uh, you know continue them in their 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 health care and their path towards wellness. It is a way that we can connect to this new era, and I, I really do encourage other programs to look at uh, integration of telehealth into into harm reduction services uh, because it's working very well for us in Miami. Thank you so much, Andrea. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I'll just add a little bit to that, which is, you know, again, one of the most, I think, exciting things about this moment is that 
there's so much sort of proof of concept stuff, which is, of course, to people working in harm reduction, you know, for several decades, all of this stuff is sort of like best practices and harm reductions about uh, removing barriers. Um, but essentially, at this moment, right, there's this, this sort of realization that the sky doesn't fall when you remove what have essentially been historic punitive aspects of care, right? So, you know, monitoring and requiring that people don't have access to take home um, MAT um, and other things. So these sort of punitive aspects that have been kind of really um, part and parcel of our entire healthcare system or treatment system, now we have this sort of momentum where people are like, oh, we could have just done that. Um, and we did it and we really grappled with our own kind of thoughts about why we thought that that was, you know, incredibly impossible before or why we thought we needed to monitor people with such a heavy hand um, and really recognize that a lot of these really low threshold and low barrier interventions that are available to us and have, you know, countless evidence to support um, some of these initiatives um, that again, the sky doesn't fall. And so I think, you know, right now at this part in this sort of historic moment with COVID and harm reduction, it's, it's sort of really a matter of, okay, well, what happens next, you know, and talking to people about these sort of incremental gains that we've made now in terms of people recognizing the importance of this low threshold stuff. How do we sort of keep the community-based harm reduction um, sort of response to that at the forefront um, so that these things are not lost, these gains are not lost, so that they're protected in the way that um, community-based orgs have been doing it for a long time. Thank you. And I want to turn it back to um, Jeffy Lee and Miss Ian in terms of how you're adapting in real time and on the ground. And in particular, if you could, you know, speak to some of the unique challenges and situations that COVID is precipitating, I think, you know, particularly around housing, um, where, you know, you have people who have been homeless or marginally housed and in some places, um, because of COVID, um, they're getting housed, you know, particularly in San Francisco and, and hotels and other places. And it really varies the extent to which um, harm reduction is integrated into those settings. In some places in San Francisco, they're actually providing people with um, alcohol and um, cannabis so that they don't have to leave their housing. And, and in others, it really just sets up um, a system of isolation because people are removed from their from their networks and in their hotel rooms um, in a place that is not offering services. So if you could just talk a little bit about um, how you're adapting on the ground and and particularly how you're addressing you know challenges around housing. Um, was it, was it for me first or was there two people? You want me to go? <laughs> I'd love both of you to answer, but Miss Ian, why don't you start? All right, cool. Um, I. So it's really, it's been off the cuff for us. So we, just because we are phase, I guess I could say like stress and anxiety um, really um, sort of exhibits and presents itself in people in so many different ways. So we're kind of just, we're learning a lot about ourselves and our coworkers and the people that we serve. Um, each one individually. So this is not, it hasn't been really easy to come up with like a generalized plan that works for everybody. So um, I'll give you, I'll give you like a, a positive example and like a, I don't know, I guess sort of a negative example that um, leans on your, uh, some of the housing issues, which is, <clears throat> so one of the, one thing that happened is one of our coworkers who's super lovely, um, had sort of a little moment, a little episode, kind of a breakdown that was like, it, it, I thought it was going to be more of a one day thing and kind of turned into a week thing where this person became uh, like a, aggressive to a certain sense. They were like, they were having a harder time controlling their substance use. They leaned a little bit more on a substance that was alcohol. They started picking fights um outside of the program with other people that they know because they live in the neighborhood and they brought it to work too so they started kind of picking fights with other co-workers that became really petty it uh it um what do you call it? it triggered other people to also having tiny moments and so we did like little little things little boundary things <clears throat> to kind of figure out like listen if you can't work right here maybe you should work over here what helps what is good instead of because also because this is our model instead of um, punishing people, we know that um, punishment doesn't really work for our um, 
for our population, right? They know, they know punishment. Punishment seems familiar. It doesn't work. So the other version is, I guess, like, so kindness and understanding. But what we learned was, is that this person, um, their daughter had died four or five years ago from an overdose. And it, that specifically was their birthday. And because of COVID-19, um, everything seemed really elevated and like less in control than normal. So they were acting even more so out of, they're like, it was like, you know, maybe it was, I don't have a degree in psychology, but it was like definitely a cry for attention, definitely a cry for like caring, but it was coming out as like a, like a fuck you to everybody, right? And so <clears throat> as I figured this out, um, we talked about it a little bit. We talked about how they processed it before, we talked about the history of it, all, the, all these different things. And from my perspective, as I guess like the boss was like this, this staff member has not ever processed this event thoroughly, right? And especially with the people that they love. So what I did was I was like, I sent them home with a little bit of homework for processing such an event like that. And then I said, I want you to come back sort of the last work day of this week and we will throw like a birthday party for your daughter, right? So we threw this like super cute birthday party. It felt really cathartic for this person. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they were able to come back the week after, um, after the birthday party and sort of after the weekend and that they, they weren't, they weren't there. They weren't in that aggressive state anymore, right? They had like a, they were able to, I don't know, forgive me because I don't know the language, but kind of put all, put, process it like a yeah sort of have a release have people understand that this was a thing and that that person's not forgotten and that um and sort of release all of these things that were just floating around in this person's head by themselves making them feel really isolated making them feel like the friends that are that are their friends aren't really their friends because they don't really know them blah, blah 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 and it kind of it just sort of threw all of that away and um they were able to come back to work and 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 perform like they were previously which was really nice so that was like a that's a thing that worked, but obviously that's not a thing that works for everybody. So what I'm talking about is like a, this, we're kind of just figuring it out off the cuff, who needs what. And when we do it that way, even though it's individualized, it helps a lot because that person becomes a little bit more understanding for when the next person has a moment, that that person can also help me to step in and figure out what that person needs. And then we can do a sort of an individualized, um, an individualized moment so that they can they can get back to where they need to be center themselves um, <clears throat> um so that was really awesome it was super it was cool it was very powerful it was, and it was a good birthday party too so uh the other thing that happened which is sadder was one of our one of our co-workers and one of our volunteers was a person who um is homeless and um and super lovely and they have a lot of health problems and <clears throat> i'm still not really clear how this works but lindsay was talking about it, that there is a hotel system that we are putting people in um, hotels who are more at risk for covid19 or who already have covid19 to do sort of a self-quarantine thing and this person's super qualified for um being super at risk that covid19 could definitely be fatal for them right um one of the issues with the hotel program is that there are no guests and we say i guess i say problem but i also understand the self-quarantine thing right but there are no guests and that can be a problem for one just for isolation for mental health issues but a bigger problem is the the overdose factor so if you don't have anybody there who is using substances with you if you overdose there is no one there to um to give you narcan or to bring you back right and so that is what happened to my friend unfortunately passed away yesterday morning but um and i'm not really sure what is a good solution for that yet but <clears throat> i can say things like i think we're going to talk more about community later in this um in this talk but mm -hmm. there is something to to say about how that person, regardless of this like really 
stupid reason why they passed away, which is really unfortunate, was also uh, at sort of the best moment in their life. I'm going from like through the union because it was like completely homeless, no friends, do like doing a lot of really petty hustling things that made them even less friends because they took advantage of a lot of people um to be able to go through our program make a lot of friends wind up in a spot that was like not like an sro hotel full of roaches but like a really nice hotel with their own bathroom like cable tv um a really nice bed three meals a day um <clears throat> and with like a whole host of people who love them right so like uh they did not pass away alone out on the cold streets of san francisco in the middle of the night they passed away inside in a really nice warm room um knowing that they have a place that they can always go and hang out with a bunch of friends so thinking about it in a positive light about how community and those things that hansel was talking about those those hugs and those smiles that uh that really go a long way in being able to have people come out of whatever substance use um, issue they have and into a more, into like a life with purpose and happiness that, um, that isn't chemically induced, I should say. Um, yeah, I think those were, those are my two sort of anecdotal um, things about what it looks like on the, on the ground here in San Francisco. Thank you, Miss Ian. Um... And so sorry to hear about the loss of really a beloved member of the San Francisco Drug Users Union and the broader San Francisco community. Um, I think more broadly, the examples that you give point to the importance of, you know, we often talk about policy and then we kind of talk about program and implementation, but what you're really getting us down to is like the brass tacks of the individualization um, that happens in developing relationships. Um, with people through harm reduction and and it's so powerful um jesse lee is there anything that you want to add on kind of um adaptation of, of harm reduction programs in this moment before we move on to our next question i think um you'd mentioned stuff like related to housing and that's been like a really big deal as far as like real time crazy movement situation over here in western north Carolina. we've had for years already like when i moved here eight years ago the average home sale price was less than one hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars and now it's three hundred thousand dollars and i mean obviously wages haven't increased in that time and so there's been just like in neighboring Asheville to the east this emphasis on tourism and drawing folks here to have second homes while fucking people that are local out of, you know, their first home. And the, the rent has increased just as much as the median home sale price. And then you have, we had a presentation in January by some folks who do housing work here. And basically like they had looked at the available rentals on the internet that morning for the Board of County Commissioners meeting and basically like nine over 98 percent of the available rentals in haywood county were airbnb vrbo so you're looking at like less than two percent of the available rentals that were posted on the internet were for local people and so that's and uh let's see dr dr bela ostrak who works with who's a research scientist and medical anthropologist out here has shown that like correlation between like no housing you know, and overdose rates. And here, our county, like, even though we show them that kind of information and we tell them it's cheaper to house people than to just let them be homeless, they're like, we just don't want to touch it. And we really can't figure that, like, okay, so you don't want to touch it with county money, federal COVID money, how about that? Like, absolutely not. So we've like scrambled because we only have a high barrier shelter here in Hay Haywood County, so you have to be completely sober to go there. And so we started a low barrier shelter and it's worked out really well. It's been such an amazing situation because we got people, you know, clinical assessments. They're in one place. We can find them. They stay connected to services. They're able to get jobs. They're able to get other housing. And even with those awesome results, just in two months, our county commissioners are like, yeah, we really don't want to touch it. And we're just like, what? 
y'all, okay, so y'all just don't care about these folks who just want them to die. Thank you for sharing that. And I think, unfortunately, um, that is often the audience that we are up against when we're advocating for increased access to um, harm reduction services, housing, and the like. Um, and it's a great transition to my next question, which is that, you know, harm reduction services in many states, you know, are or were deemed essential. Um, and I want to Kind of dig into how we can best leverage this moment to actually amplify the need for harm reduction and secure policy victories or funding allocations that can really help make harm reduction services more sustainable and widespread, both in this moment of COVID, but also beyond. Um, maybe Hansel, I'll start with you just because I recall that when we were doing the advocacy around um, syringe access in Florida, one of the messages was actually around um, crises and was around um, hurricanes and the like, particularly as we were trying to combat um, folks who thought there needed to be a one-to-one -one exchange. Um, so what, what are your thoughts in terms of how we can leverage this moment into advocacy? What messages might resonate um, with people um, with respect to COVID and, and the need for harm reduction? Yeah, I, I think that it's very important. So unfortunately, with our legislation, we, we weren't successful in, in striking the one-for-one -one exchange provision. But when the governor issued the emergency order for the state of Florida, we uh, changed that because the CDC guidance, which came out weeks later, but definitely mirrored the policies that we had put in place at IDEA, we wanted to make sure that we were adhering to social distancing. So if we gave people more syringes, there would be fewer visits to our program. Uh, people would be able to, to shelter in place for, for longer. Uh, if people were, um, it's uh, it's it's tough because there is this uh, in harm reduction. We always say uh, never use alone, and now everybody's supposed to be alone. Everybody's supposed to to social distance. So so how do we we reconcile that uh, with with what we've been telling people? But I do think that one good thing about COVID is again nobody's really watching what is going on in terms of harm reduction. So we're able to, in restrictive environments, uh, practice harm reduction with best practices, which is uh, very uplifting to be able to do uh, here in Miami. And basically we're just going to have to go back to the legislature and show them that the increased provision of syringes did not lead to any catastrophic Armageddon. Uh, it was actually police brutality that did that. And uh, I do think that this is, uh, it gives us the opportunity it, in, when hurricanes come, we do the same thing with uh, increased provision of syringes, uh, more naloxone. Um, generally, we're, we're telling people not to use alone, and uh, now we're telling people to, to check in with a friend before they use and, and do check-in calls afterwards to make sure that people are, are okay. And we've just really had to, to, to adapt to the, 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 where we live now. But there are many changes that are going to have to occur um, Jesse was talking about shelters and housing. Um, if any of you follow me on Twitter, you know I've been infuriated during COVID because uh, I've had patients who have been in recovery and on Suboxone for six months who tested positive for cannabis. First, I don't know why they're testing my patients for, for drugs while they're living in a homeless shelter, but they test positive for cannabis and they wheel them out right into the street in Miami. And it's, it's shocking. It's shocking. So as we, this is the time where we need to to really advocate for, for housing first and, and, and the end of like this real discrimination against people who use drugs uh, because we know what that discrimination roots in. It's, it's really just the carceral and punitive approach to substance use uh, as opposed to a, a medical approach. And a lot of that is, is rooted in, in racism and the, the racist drug policies that, that we have in our country. So we need to use this moment to to forge forward and, and try to, to change things. Uh, but it's, uh, as everything has been in harm reduction, uh, you know, I came to harm reduction maybe, I don't know, like 12 years ago. I, I mean, it's always been a fight. Whenever I visit San Francisco, I'm shocked that they're still fighting. Vancouver, they're still fighting. It makes me feel better about the fights that I'm having here in Miami. The fact that you all are still fighting. I mean, we're all fighters and that's what we're gonna be doing uh, even in the COVID era.
Absolutely. Well, let's talk about one of those sites in San Francisco, which has been um, the fight for supervised consumption sites. And of course, this is not unique to San Francisco. Um, there are a whole host of jurisdictions, including Philadelphia and New York City and um, Baltimore and Seattle and others that are considering. But Ms. Ann, is this an opportunity to fight even harder for this type of intervention? Is this what the community wants and needs in this moment? And so how should we um, tailor our advocacy around that? Um, these are such good questions. I, um, yeah, kind of like um, picking out, piggybacking out what Hansel said. It's like, I am pro, just, um, I guess because I don't understand, I'm not too good at politics. I'm learning a lot um, uh, working at the Drug Users Union. But um, I do agree with the idea that to push for a service like um, safe injection facilities right now when people are paying less attention um, is a great idea just because of, as anyone, if, if anyone has done this fight, um, knows that the most ridiculous things will come up that prevent <clears throat> that service from becoming an actuality. So it might be the best time to get it done. The problems, or I, say, I should say the thing that's been interesting right now is I wonder if we're in a lull in San Francisco for being excited about that service, um, just because we've had um, a lot of defeats maybe, and because <clears throat> COVID-19 kind of threw everything into a whirlwind of what we want in the moment. So, <clears throat> the from just from my small perspective of the drug users union there has not been actually a lot of uh excitement or interest in getting something like a safe injection facility started right now from people who are drug users which has just been an just an interesting factoid from our spot and the people that we see um, I think maybe it could also be because, I don't know if anybody knows about this, but we were about to open this thing called a meth sobering center um, in San Francisco that was like a weird, like three fourths of a step to a safe injection facility. And what the idea was is like, it was basically like this center that was open 24 hours a day that people could come to. Um, I think mostly what, what politics wanted or what politicians wanted was they wanted a place to put anybody who was outside having a psychotic break that was like a little bit less symptomatic where they could send them to something like psych emergency services also because psych emergency services is really expensive so they wanted to send them somewhere where they could like sit down watch tv drink some water relax um and so they kind of created this idea this thing called a meth sobering center even though we all know that people who are screaming outside don't necessarily do methamphetamines. So it was based off of a stereotype of how that drug works and what people are experiencing who are having um, psychotic episodes. And uh, <clears throat> so, but even if it was based off that, I was like, if you want a service for people who are homeless to be able to access bathrooms and a place to sit down and eat snacks 24 hours a day, I was like, yeah, sure, who cares? Um, it's not like they're going to you know, do some sort of urine test to see if you've actually done methamphetamines before you enter. So who cares? But um, that died right because COVID-19 happened. You like can't have a bunch of people just walking into a shared space. So that just flopped. Um, so yeah, I sort of have conflicting feelings about it. I'm very pro, like I think that we should try and push and see if we can't get maybe at least the policies um, approved to say that we can start and do this thing. But then I, I think that we should definitely in San Francisco sit down and have a moment to figure out where those staff are gonna come from, who's gonna train them, like what it's actually going to look like instead of to instead of doing a thing that they might do, which is create a safe injection facility and then just, I don't know, kind of just throw it all together really fast and throw a bunch of money at it and just and cross our fingers and hope for the best. I think that we, not to say that we haven't sat down for, right, like the last 20 years <clears throat> that I'm now joining and, and have these conversations, but to really, really do it and really, um, 
spend time and energy to make sure that it's done exactly how we want it to be done. Um, does that answer Yeah, that? I think what you're highlighting is, yeah, absolutely, it's so important. I mean, I think that we need to continue this fight um, for supervised consumption sites, but we need to make sure that always what is centered is um, the people who are using drugs who are actually going to access that site, that their yeah. needs and their voices are elevated um, and in this moment of COVID, if there are needs that are more salient and more immediate, then that's where we need to shift our priority in terms of our advocacy um, to make sure we're addressing that um, and then can uh, circle back around to some of these other reforms. Exactly. Um, so, Jamie, you know, I want to go to you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Ian. No, I was just going to say, so that, that the conflict is just like that there's a push for these services, the safe injection facility services, but right now it's coming from voices of people who don't necessarily, aren't going to access those services. And that, you know what I mean? So it, it's fine, but also it, it's a weird, it has a weird feel to it at the moment. No, That's it all. means to be the opposite way. Absolutely. Right. Um, thank you for uplifting that. Um, Jamie, I want to go to you and just see, um, you know, I think that your program is so innovative. Um, and, but it really stands alone. It kind of stands out. And so do you think there is an opportunity here to really advocate for um, increased funding or um, you know, other mechanisms that might make it possible for people to replicate um, the type of program that you're offering to expand you know, much broader access? Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, but I also want to recognize the history of harm reduction programs having, uh, we've been mailing supplies for a very long time and uh, programs all over the country have been mailing supplies. What Next is trying to do is create a hub and spoke model so that other syringe exchange programs across the country can implement a mail based uh, model of delivery without having to put all of the um, effort into technology. Um, we've been building our platform for two years and um, one of our main uh, our, our main tenants is the security and the privacy of people who inject drugs. Um, getting services through the mail and online should never put anyone at risk, especially with drug-induced homicide laws now. So um, Building this technology has been challenging and we're trying to build it for the national harm reduction community so that everyone can start to do this type of work. And we've also seen uh, states like programs in Maine and Idaho and Montana adopting and California um, adopting statewide mail based programs and the time is now to do it. So um, I'm really excited. Like, let's let's all do it now. They can't arrest us all. So, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here. Um, although this theme has popped up throughout the conversation, um, which is that you know, harm reduction as a form of community care really seems more salient than ever. Um, we see the systematic oppressions, you know, through the lens of COVID is really undeniable in terms of who is dying, who receives care, um, and who has been left out. Um, and in particular, when our formal systems of care are failing black and brown people, including indigenous communities, failing people who are homeless, failing trans people, um, failing people who use drugs, of course, how do we create a broader form um, of mutual aid through harm reduction programs? Um, <clears throat> And this is the conversation I'm actually going to quote from Dean Spade, who defines mutual aid as a form of political participation in which people take responsibility for caring for one another and changing political conditions, not through symbolic acts or putting pressure on representatives, but by actually building new social relations that are more survivable. Um, and Jesse Lee, I'm going to turn to you first to kind of tackle this broad question. Um, and then Andrea, I'm going to hand it over to you. Lindsay, do you mind repeating that question for me? I'm sorry. Sure. The essence of the question is just um, <clears throat> how do we view harm reduction through a mutual aid lens, which is that, you know, when the formal systems fail us, 
um, how is harm reduction um, creating communities? How is it um, creating new systems that can step in to fill the gap um, that aren't creating the same harms as these formalized systems, and particularly the harms that we've seen in the context of COVID um, in terms of who is dying and who's getting care? Well, I mean, guys, I mean, experiencing that, like I've already mentioned with the, the housing situation here, and I, I really don't know what the mutual aid situation will look like. Um, I mean, because the, there's such a disparity as far as like resources here that I'm like, uh, it's almost like the people that have been helping us to like fund this low barrier shelter the last couple months, it's almost like everybody's like tapped out, the organizations are tapped out, like the individuals that have had churches contribute. And it's like in our, in Haywood County, it's going to look like, I mean, because people don't want to use taxpayer money to do stuff like this. It's like, it's going to be forcing churches to actually like, be Christian, if that makes sense. And because if it's like every church in Haywood County, there's 259 churches here. Every church gave like five dollars a day to you know harm reduction and everything in, that harm reduction means. The big umbrella, like including housing, we could get it, we could get everyone in Haywood County taken care of. Thank you, Andrea. You want to add your thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, again, this this question really intersects so many of the issues that we're talking about, but, um, you know, thinking a lot about the, the resources that are getting circulated right now in terms of mutual aid um, and really thinking through, again, like what happens in the next stage um, of COVID and what happens sort of in the next stage of harm reduction and this kind of new reality. Um, so thinking through really that, like, engagement in institutionalized spaces has come with sort of costs and consequences. Um, and so maybe kind of looking back and thinking through what a kind of, you know, a mutual aid network that is sort of a community base, what that looks like. Um, and I think, unfortunately, you know, as, as I've worked in different places that are trying to kind of institutionalize um, harm reduction, whether, you know, starting with syringe access programs or naloxone distribution programs or other things, that there really still is this barrier for people thinking of harm reduction practices as part of primary care, as part of whole person health. Um, so thinking again about like this conversation right now has a potential to sort of realign with what we're actually like deeply talking about our health inequities and health injustices. Um, and then again, thinking through then what, how resources sort of get distributed within that context so that they don't sort of get lost in, you know, the big machines of of you know, what are our sort of state and federal budgets um, to address these issues. Um, so I think just to echo what many people have said, right, that um, you know, this is, again, everyone is so busy, everyone's working you know, 24 hours a day and nobody's sleeping, everybody's carrying intense sort of emotional burdens, but you know, it does bear some thinking through of like what happens when, again, we create our own sort of national mutual aid institutions that you know, are not necessarily reliant on these sort of large institutional frameworks that we know, you know, there's been costs in the past for, for sort of engaging those things. So, so I don't know, I'm personally excited with, you know, as much as everybody's sort of, um, you know, working constantly and not getting any sleep, the, the conversation has changed a little bit into, again, completely reimagining the ways that everybody is engaging with each other um, in this historic moment. And some of those barriers that have been in place, you know, for so long kind of um, dropping, dropping out in some ways. Thank you. And Jimmy, I know that, um, of course, what you're doing is getting supplies um, to people in places that otherwise can't access them. That, that, but that also means that potentially they don't have a network that they can access for support. And so I know part of your work is really around mobilization um, of communities as well. So can you talk a little bit about that and how you're trying to um, forge that for people who might not have community within, you know, in their backyard? Sure. We're connected to folks across the country that act as grassroots hub, small syringe exchange programs. So um, they may be, you know, they may be doing distribution with syringes we send them and harm reduction supplies we send them um, across a, a few zip codes. So really trying to um, 
uplift their work and provide as much education and connection to the current national uh, harm reduction initiatives that are in play and connecting them with uh, programs like Urban Survivors Union has been really important. So um, I think we have a real call to action now to stop all this silly one for one exchange and to provide people more syringes than they need and provide people more naloxone than they need because drug users support drug users and we need to make sure that uh, our work is reaching deeper into communities and that we're empowering uh, folks to be leaders, harm reduction leaders uh, within their own social networks. Thank you. Um, and drug users supporting drug users. I mean, I've just been, I don't even know if I have a question. It's really just a um, moment of recognition um, in terms of what Ms. Ian has done in San Francisco, but what drug users unions are doing across this country in terms of really um, building community, but being able to see it firsthand in San Francisco, um, it's so much more than accessing the services. It really is about the community that Ms. Ian has been able to create, not just within the walls of the union, but really within the tenderloin. And so I don't know if I have a question, Ms. Ian, but if there's anything you want to add about how you built that community um, or, or folks or ideas for folks who may be thinking about starting a drug users union um, as a form of mutual aid, you know, feel free to jump in. Um, sure. Uh, gosh, that was so nice. I was like, I feel like a superhero or something. Um, you are. I don't know about all that, but <clears throat> we did it. We did it together. Um, the only thing I, th I think what really kicked it off was um, there are some other needle exchanges in San Francisco that have a lot more resources than we do. And when a thing happens, when you have more resources, you have like a lot more rules, right? And if there's anything that we know about I would say a lot of people who use drugs is that a lot of us are a little bit like authority resistant and um, aren't the best at um, following rules, either, um, either on purpose or not on purpose. So I think, I think when um, I had this opportunity to, uh, I don't know, sort of be, be the boss here at, at the union, um, there is a big push for um, for to not just ha to not tokenize ourselves and not put us in positions that are you can only be awarded a ten dollar gift card um, every week or every two weeks, but to have like a meaningful purpose filled job position that doesn't say like uh, I'm a drug user, don't give me a lot of responsibilities because I'll mess it up. Position job, right? So I think what we did was we we structured our program to um, allow people to make as many mistakes as possible and to learn from them because one of the big issues as far as i saw was that people people who a lot of times people who didn't get to have childhoods where you learn these things, where you get to make mistakes and then either your parents or your guardian or whoever gets to tell you like, ooh, don't do that, that's gonna hurt other people, or that's gonna hurt yourself, or that will, there'll be a consequence uh, later on down the line that you won't like. Um, lots of us didn't get to experience that. We didn't have those role models, we didn't have those teachers. So, um, and then when you turn 18, you're on your own and our American culture says, you should have learned that stuff. It's not our problem. You're an adult. So every time we make a mistake, everyone looks at you and you're like, you're an idiot. How come you didn't know this? But how were we supposed to? So at the union, we, we I guess what I, what I saw at other programs was that same thing was being upheld in their, their employment. So people were given the, they like give a job to someone who was experiencing homelessness or is an active drug user. And then within the week or two weeks, they like get fired because they don't, they didn't know how to follow a certain rule. And then they were let go for whatever reason and they don't understand it. And they, they weren't necessarily given an opportunity to learn from it. Um, and that reinforces that cycle that like I'm worthless. How can I ever 
get back into society. This is my place. I am, I am not human. I can't have a job. I can't have responsibilities, right? You tell yourself that because that's the lesson that you just learned. So at the union, we put in a model to say like, you can't, you, like basically you can't get fired unless you do something horrendous, but you can, um, there are moments where like, uh, like the person I was telling you about who, you know, even though they were here picking fights with other staff members and not being completely work appropriate, that we sit down and we figure out why, like what is happening? What is going on? Why are you acting like that? Is this a cycle? Is this a new thing? And because that person doesn't have those people in their life to process those things, right? So um, we, I think I, if I was to impart any thing to anybody who's listening is to like, don't pretend that you're helping by um, having those expectations that you have for people who have had completely positive childhood experiences and got to go to college and learn all of these things and don't have the same expectations for them as people who had horrendous upbringings, didn't get to learn any of those lessons, don't have any uh, like uh, education outside of you know public schooling, which maybe they didn't even go to in the first place, have never processed any of their trauma, have like, yeah, horrible, uh, yeah, traumas that they've never gotten to uh, work through and, and yeah, expect them to perform the exact same way. And when they don't, we punish them for that. Like that's not a fair system. So let's create systems that allow for people to process their traumas, figure out coping skills that they need to be able to succeed. And we hold space for them, which is what I would call like community. And in that space, like that they can learn and then they will give back that the way that they can, they can figure out their own, their own style, their own way that they can tr contribute in, in ways that make them feel good. And I'll be honest, like there are struggles that we have here at the union, but more often than not, it works great. It works really, really good. And so, and that's why we have a staff that's a hundred percent people who use drugs and, um, and reflect the neighborhood that we exist in and that why we have a lot of trust in this neighborhood because we as an organization trusted them to do a good job and to work on themselves um, the way that we will work on ourselves and then we hold each other accountable and that I just think like that's a positive community like create a positive community um, and the rest will sort of fall into place. Oh, is that? <laughs> yes, that is absolutely a um, positive community. And thanks to all the panelists for talking about ways that um, we can strengthen those communities. Um, I want to depart momentarily from COVID because uh, we know in this moment that, in fact, many of our communities are under siege. Um, and DPA's mission is to reduce the harms of drug use. Uh, but also to reduce the harms of drug prohibition. And the harms of drug prohibition have really never been clearer. Um, the drug war fuels and justifies militarized police forces that assault, harass, um, and kill people of color. And so I want to um, take space for this moment and ask what it means to be a harm reductionist working to end the drug war in all of its manifestations. Um, and to end all of its harms. Um, and so I'd like for our last question for each of you to answer this. Um, I'm gonna start with Hansel, um, but I'd like your just kind of general reflections on this, but then I'd like you in particular to offer our audience two things. Um, one is what can we do right now to reduce harm um, and particularly the harm around prohibition um, and, um, and the policing, um, of communities of color that um, is justified by by the drug war. Um, but that may be incremental, but something that we can do right now. Um, and then I would like you to think a little bit more visionary and name one one goal that you would really like us to work towards um, that may not be immediate, but um, that should be aspirational um, and that we should start setting the groundwork for. So Hansel, I'm gonna throw that one to you first. Oh, that's hard. I, I mean, so the first thing that I would say, I'm actually borrowing this from one of my colleagues. A lot of you probably 
uh, read about Dr. Armin Henderson getting handcuffed for trying to help people experiencing homelessness during COVID. Uh, we trained together and he gave grand rounds recently and he told all of the faculty in the Department of Medicine, don't call the police for stupid shit, is what he said in grand rounds, which is a big deal in academic medicine for someone to say something like that. And interestingly, I had to reflect on myself because I had had a patient a few days earlier call me in the middle of the night. She was, uh, she had uh, suicidal ideation and I sent an email to the social worker and I said, why don't you send uh, the police to do a wellness check? So <laughs> the social worker, who's like a 60 year old white lady was like, how about we don't? And she was so much more woke than, than I was in that situation. And then when Armin said, don't call the police for stupid shit, I was like, oh my gosh, you're absolutely right. Like, don't call them unless it's, just don't call them. It's, it's not something. Um, so immediately, I mean, that's really what we need to, to do. Uh, I mean, because those situations can escalate, as we all saw with George Floyd. They can end uh, in murder, uh, you know, broadcast a billion times on television. And, and so, so don't call the police. Everybody needs to remember that. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a, a real thing. And it's been a very interesting time being a black male physician. Uh, luckily, when, uh, when everything happened with George Floyd, I was beginning a two-week tour at our public hospital on the HIV service. So dealing with the things that we should be dealing with in 2020, you know, 25 year old black woman who's pregnant with toxoplasmosis, which is an opportunistic infection that should not be seen in this country at this day and age. But I, I was taking care of people with a intense illness as a result of systemic, you know, discrimination and racism that we have in our community. So I had a time to detach from everything that was going on. I really feel that had I been at home watching that video and experiencing what had happened to George Floyd as we all did, I really, uh, it would have been a very dark, dark period for me. But luckily I, I was able to, to separate and to, to take care of my patients and it gave me more time to reflect. I, I mean, I knelt for eight minutes and 46 seconds, multiple times on campus, uh, but I was really focused on taking care of my patients. One thing that this entire uh, COVID and racial Armageddon has, has really shown me, it's interesting because you said, something more, you know, I, I think that you, my response to your second question about my hope for the future is going to be uh, a lot more simple than you think that I'm going to say. And it's really just that we all come back to treating each other with kindness because this is such an unkind country and people are so unkind. I had no idea how selfish human beings are until all of this. It has been probably the biggest disappointment uh, of my life, seeing the, the way that the country is now. My husband and I are having a baby in October. I can't, this world that we're bringing her into, I, I, it's a, it's, just, oh, Miss Ian's happy. That makes me happy because I'm obsessed with Miss Ian. <laughs> <laughs> so we're excited to have a baby and we have, we have that to look forward to, but this is a dark, dark time. And I just, I mean, so I'm, everybody knows that I, I attend a little bit further left on the political spectrum, but I understand why people are on the right side because nobody cares anything else about anyone. That is what this has shown us. Nobody cares. So my hope and dream for this world is that we come back to a place of kindness. Thank you, Hansel. And fundamentally, that's what harm reduction is about. And thank you also for um, bringing it down to an individualized level because we're obviously advocating to defund police. There's lots of other calls, but we also have to look inward and say, what are, what are we doing within our own lives that's contributing to the systematic oppression? And even something as simple as don't call the police being echoed um, in hospitals and, and academic chambers is, is, chambers is incredibly important and, and can be impactful um, in and of itself. Um, Andrea? Um, sure, so I think, you know, sort of in the same way as Hansel sort of described it is that, you know, there are these moments of profound sadness and unrest and also these moments where you say, okay, wait, is this sort of a magical day where I'm able to reflect and see these sort of glimpses of, you know, things that might sort of move forward. Um, and so I think, you know, it, you know, the, on the daily basis, right, one thing I'm, I'm sort of excited about is that, you know, sort of 
harm reduction comes around and really supports black woman-led abolitionist movements. Um, and so I think seeing that merger is really exciting. So the Eight to Abolition um, campaign um, that's actually having a webinar this evening at five, I think, Eastern time. Um, and then, you know, again, it's as many different institutional spaces are going through their own reckoning, you know, I think thinking around the sort of vision of what is our sort of harm reduction movement in the US and, and thinking and seeing through what transformation through black, indigenous, trans and Latinx leadership looks like, um, you know, what more sort of expansive inclusion so that you know, communities who may not have felt um, that harm reduction had necessarily a place for them um, can begin to sort of craft their own images and their own ideas. Um, and this is happening in many different places, but I think we still have, you know, significant work within our own sort of national movement around equity and what that looks like in terms of leadership. Um, and certainly what that looks like in terms of what people get paid to do the different work that they do, right? So we still have a tremendous issue with, you know, people of color, uh, being underpaid in terms of a lot of these, um, you know, positions that we have in harm reduction related to sort of peer service positions and stuff. So I think, you know, this is also a good time again to do internal reflection in our movement. Um, you know, we are so primed to engage in these conversations, um, but also we have our own sort of internal work to do that we can't sort of lose sight of in terms of the sort of equity question and the, the sort of injustices that have happened in the movement as well. Absolutely. And if you could actually drop a link to the webinar that you mentioned with respect to um, Black women-led abolitionists, I think that would be a wonderful way to elevate that leadership and, and something I think our audience would be very interested in participating in. Um, Jesse Lee, I'm going to hand it over to you. So just um, two days ago, I uh, went to the sheriff of Haywood County to present to him some, some data from a survey. We did a participant satisfaction survey in eight, it was administered in eight different counties in North Carolina. And so Haywood County ended up with the highest rate of, conf con highest rate of confiscation of harm reduction supplies attained from um, an exchange out of those eight surveyed counties, as well as the highest rate of arrest for the possession of supplies. And before we'd gotten, we, we like seen that data or even had that survey, that was um, kind of a concern. I mean, that was like something our participants were like, this happens a lot. But without that data, it's just like, you know, people who use drugs complaining about shit that the law enforcement just turns around and says is not true, of course. Um, I mean, we even had, we have one, one person who works in law enforcement here that takes naloxone from people who use drugs when, when, whenever he, he sees, you know, stops them and sees that. He's like, you know, if you're stupid enough to do drugs, then you don't deserve to live. And so we've had this, now we have this like data that shows like, you know, in comparison to the rest of these counties, some of these counties in North Carolina, what's potentially going on here. And then right after this, uh, talk, I'm actually going to speak with a woman who has about nine other folks in it that have instances of like illegal cavity searches. And so we've, w there's this air, you know, or, like this thought here within the community, even if they're pro harm reduction, they're still like pro law enforcement and believe, you know, that, that whatever law enforcement is doing is fine kind of thing. And so right now is when I'm, when like, Use, use this data, use this information to like kind of just like keep the momentum to like, hey, police, you know, need to back the fuck off and we need to like not put as many resources here and put them like, oh, towards this housing thing that we've been talking about and talking about and talking about. So that's, that's what's going on over here. Thank you. Yeah, that reinvestment of resources is so critical um, in this moment. Um, Jamie. Hi. Um, I think for me, uh, the recognition that harm reduction, the harm reduction community is so white is something that we need to reckon with. Um, and if, 
if, if you're not having conversations about racial equity in your work and how we dismantle white supremacy that is in harm reduction, if we're not doing that, if, if organizations are not doing that, if funders are not doing that, um, scratch that, everyone needs to be doing it and doing it now. And um, I mean, for next harm reduction, it's a brand new modality. And if you put a harm reduction program, a student exchange program, on the internet, what can it look like? And how can it particularly serve black and brown people? And one thing that was really striking was we're not a content producer. Uh, we see ourselves as um, uh, gathering resources and it is extremely difficult to find harm reduction resources that have black and brown faces that are not in English, that are not white, English speaking men. So I think that harm reduction in general has not held itself accountable for the white supremacy that is inherent in our movement. Um, and in terms of being part of the solution, something that we've done is created a work plan for how next response to white supremacy in harm reduction and ensuring we're not replicating it. Um, it can be found on our website and it's a open document that our community can comment on. Um, so please feel free to take a look and see what we're doing. Um, and in terms of goals, um, I'd like to see more of a national strategy being built. I think a lot of times because laws are state by state or syringe possession laws, we're siloed and um, we need to be building more of a national movement and I certainly look to Drug Policy Alliance and Harm Reduction Coalition for leadership on this issue. Um, I think, you know, Louise Vincent is a superwoman, but she's not a magician. And we need to look to our, the larger harm reduction organizations to support national mobilization. Thank you so much, Jamie. And that self-accountability is so critical and so important, and I hope people will provide feedback um, on what you're working on there. Miss Ian, with a final word before we go to Q&A. Oh my lord, you need a final word? Oh gosh. Okay. <clears throat> Let me, uh, I'm just gonna say a few, these are like thoughts I've had, um, but one, thinking of everything, I think um, as a person who benefits from white privilege is, a, I think that I noticed is like, um, is comfort, like comfortability. And I think um, a thing that I would like, like for people to ask, um, we're doing a lot of like, ask yourself these questions, but I think one of the ones that always strikes me is like comfort. Like people get really upset when they start to feel uncomfortable. And I think especially my own people because of what is white privilege, there is a, like an internal structure or something um, that is like, what is fair is that I shouldn't be made to, f to feel discomfort. And I don't, I don't think that's a thing that we've really analyzed about um, ourselves a lot. And I think uh, it is, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's really interesting, especially in, in conversations that are happening now, especially about race. Um, because as I'm sure a lot of people have noticed, um, and my people especially get really upset when they are, when they have a moment when they don't feel like they're being heard or they don't feel like they're being heard first even. Sometimes they like need to have their point heard before the conversation can continue. And it has something to do with comfort, our level of comfortability. And I, I think that um, some really poignant and positive change will happen when we start to grapple with what is comfort what is like or the illusion of comfort or anything like that that um i think that people should really start paying attention to what why am i uncomfortable and where is that coming from and is when i when i lash out because i'm uncomfortable is that fair because the original, your, I'm sure a lot of people's original feeling is like, I'm uncomfortable, that's unfair to me. But not taking into context the, the greater, a greater picture. And I, that definitely has to do with something that is like, um, to my next point, which is like a, something about this country and the individual, right? 
we did a lot of talk about community, but it's also really hard to create community because there's a pressure to individually succeed um, just in life, right? So um, there's a lot of times too, like as, as someone who's like a manager, that if you, if someone does something bad or wrong on my team, that there's a pressure for me to feel like it's my fault, right? And, um, and that also could be my discomfort. And like, I've seen a lot of other people be like, if, and then if I'm uncomfortable, I feel like I need to punish that person for making me feel uncomfortable and impeding my own success. And then it's taken it away from a team idea and turned into an individual success story, right? So I love, I want us to, I would love for us to focus more on what is, what is teamwork and what is community. And cause I really feel like a better tomorrow would be more like um, when we, when we do create like um, safe injection facilities or whatever that it is, um, that the people who are like, who are lauded for creating them is like a community. It's someone being like, the, the Tenderloin had a, a lot of pull in making this happen in San Francisco or whoever in Philadelphia, but not an individual. And I think that that, if we're able to like kind of turn our egos down a little bit and like, or switch our egos over to like being part of this, this greater community with, I guess like without losing your individuality to a, to a degree, but um, um, there is some, I don't know, there's something there. I keep playing with it in my head, I guess. And I, I think that, yeah, there's something about, um, there's something there with community and, um, and individuality and this weird ego thing and how we feel comfortable or uncomfortable. And then the other thing, the last thing I want to say, like when you're thinking about visionary stuff, and I hope, I mean, I might get in trouble for saying this, but out of all of the I things- I know you'll get on trouble on this call. We'll see. I'll, uh, I'll make my emails public or something. Everyone can see. Um, but, uh, as much as like, a so this drug war that we're fighting against, there is, with all of its complications and nuances and, and stuff like that, and how like treatment centers work and like, regardless of, of us, um, supporting more drug users and drug user voices now, uh, there is still like a pressure to be, or like a happier life is clean and sober um and how like even that language is problematic but uh, but there is a pressure to not do as many drugs or that your happiness is fake if you do a lot of drugs right and i think in out of everything that is harm reduction i'm also kind of like i don't think that this movement is necessarily about drugs i don't i don't think that we're doing anything with drugs it doesn't have a lot to do with drugs for me it has a lot to do with people and with people's behavior. And I think that drugs don't change people to a large extent, but I do think it does a thing where it like lowers your inhibitions. I do think that um, it gives you permission to act in ways that, uh, that you might not have done so or that you were scared to do if you were sober. And um, because there's a lot of like where we don't hold people accountable for something when they're high. And I think that, that is a problem because, I, because we do that here at the union. It doesn't matter if you're high or, or not high or whatever. You, you did what you did and you do have to be accountable for it, right? Um, and so I guess in the future, I would love for us to actually kind of deprioritize drugs and who is using what and trying to figure out why a person is acting a certain way and like looking at drugs first you'd be like oh it's because they do they do heroin or like they only they do goofballs or like they would do that because they're on meth or whatever because no matter what there is someone who does meth who doesn't do that behavior so that it's completely unscientific to think that way in general but i would love for us to deprioritize the idea of drugs uh affecting us and to actually just look at people their life their stories 
historical contents, cultural context, and all that stuff, and, and prioritize those things, and, and then add drugs to it to see how maybe drugs were able to tweak a little bit the other things that I think are more meaningful in people's lives. Um, which is why I think, that, right, just like how we talk about a lot, I think that's, that's where it's stigmatized. Like a lot of people have a lot of issues because they added a little bit of drugs to help them out and then stigma crushed them to think that they are completely worthless. And instead of thinking about how stigma did that, we think about how the idea that they chose to do heroin and got high did that to them. But that's not the case. Does that make sense? Either way, um, those are my ideas. <laughs> I lost Lindsay. I'm just going to voice for her. She says, yeah, you did a good job. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, um, you know, we know that War on Drugs was never actually about drugs, which is why we're partly in this moment, because we know it's actually about enforcing and policing communities of color. We also know that the end goal should not be to end drug use or to ensure that everyone gets in treatment, right? So for me, like taking moderator's privilege, one of my kind of like um, visionary goals is really around um, regulation of drug use so that it is accessible, so that there is safe supply, so that for people who do want to use, they can um, right. have a safe source to access and we can fundamentally dismantle the enforcement arm of the war on drugs. Um, so that would be my vision. We are having a conversation about that. Um, legal regulation and safe supply um, in just a few weeks. So again, take a look at that. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Mary, who has a queue of questions waiting for our panelists. Um, and maybe panelists, we can keep our answers short and sweet so we can try to uh, get through um, as many as we can. Mary? Hi, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay, great. Um, so we have a ton of great questions and we're not gonna get to them all, I apologize in advance, but we had a couple about using a loan during COVID-19. Annie asks, can we endorse a harm reduction strategy that allows people to use with at least one partner in the context of COVID? And Alana asks, what do people think about consumption hotlines for people using a loan? Is there any evidence of the effectiveness of this model um, or even anecdotal info? about hotlines for people who have access to phones. Lindsay, I don't think we can hear you. Anybody in particular want to take that or maybe um, Hansel, I'll throw that to you. Yeah, so uh, in the, the brief paper that I was talking about, we, we did call for the use of hotlines. I'm not sure that it's ever been studied, but maybe Andrea and I will, will study it and get back to you at the next DPA or Harm Reduction Coalition uh, meeting. Uh, it's, it's definitely, it, we're in a desperate time, and the same way that this whole harm reduction movement was born in a desperate time, we're going to have to come up with uh, solutions. And I think that we need to ask people who use drugs what the appropriate solutions are. But what I and my co-authors could, my co-authors and I could offer was the the use of uh, phone check-ins, which I've seen a lot from uh, Sarah Ziegenhorn, another uh, MD harm reductionist in Iowa. Uh, that's a, a service that she was offering uh, in Iowa City. Uh, so I do think that that's a, a good idea. In terms of uh, using, you know, in, in a little bubble in groups, I, I do always, as a physician, I have to recommend that when you're with other people that you don't live with, that you wear a mask, but that's all the new model of harm reduction. I, I didn't mention that immediately when we moved into COVID mode at the idea exchange, we started handing out masks to everybody. We started handing out hand sanitizer to everybody. And those sorts of uh, preventative materials just have to become uh, part of what we do, just like we do COVID testing with HIV and Hep C testing now. Uh, so uh, I do think it's uh, it's best to get the response from people who use drugs, but the hotlines are definitely uh, promising. Thank you, Mary. We'll go to the next one. Sure. We had a couple questions about um, use and meth prescribing during this time. Jody asks if people are taking advantage of the relaxed federal rules for prescribing buprenorphine and for the take home doses of methadone. Are there any problems with these changes and are people taking advantage of it? 
And then Allison raised the issue of racial disparity of prescription of methadone and buprenorphine. She says it's been evidence that more people of color are provided methadone while the majority of people using buprenorphine are white. Should there be advocacy to address this? For example, lower barrier methadone access or more equitable access to buprenorphine? Actually, Hansel addressed that in the Q&A line, but um, I thought it was worth bringing up for everybody to hear as well. Yeah, so uh, as soon as we, uh, we, so I'm not sure everybody knows, but med students across the country were removed from clinical rotations uniformly back in, in March. So imagine that, like a whole generation of, of future doctors getting pulled from service. But my, my students came to me and they said, well, how do we continue to serve? They had already founded a wound care clinic that they do every week. And they said, how do we continue to serve our community? And that's where we started doing these uh, telehealth encounters, including telephone, or video conference for low barrier buprenorphine. And we've done many of these visits. Right now, SAMHSA has lowered the, um, the threshold. We don't have to get urine drug screens. We can do things uh, via phone, even for the first, uh, the first visit. What we have to do moving forward is make sure that these man-made barriers remain removed, but it has been amazing to be able to, to get buprenorphine to people. I always prefer buprenorphine because it preserves like autonomy for, for the patient, but um, you know, there are huge disparities, obviously we know in the prescription of buprenorphine and uh, we all have to, to work to, to end, those, end those disparities. Lindsay, you want me to go on together? Okay, uh, this is more for direct service folks. Uh, James asks, what suggestions do panelists have for doing outreach to people who use drugs who are not already engaged in harm reduction services at this time? Jesse Lee, do you wanna start us off on that one? Yeah, and I actually need to, I couldn't, I couldn't hear it. Hear no problem. Uh, what suggestions do panelists have for doing outreach to people who use drugs who are not already engaged in harm reduction services at this time? I keep missing the first part. I'm, I apologize. No worries. It's what um, outreach can be done to people who are not already engaged in harm reduction services? Um, that is a really good, actually like this person that I am going to visit with right after this panel discussion that has um, experienced like this police brutality situation I learned of through uh, like a person who gets harm reduction services locally and so I connected with with her through you know a person and now she like once we started this conversation about first of all like do i trust you enough to tell you all these stories and trust you with in this information um and i was like do you you know do you need harm reduction supplies and she's like absolutely like i need a lot and so, i mean that's i mean that's just one example that comes to me right now because it's right in front of me but i'm not sure and it's definitely something to think about Thank you. Miss Ian, are you doing anything in San Francisco to try to engage folks who aren't already connected? Um, I was going to say, like, uh, our outreach program didn't get funded this year, so we're doing less outreach, but we have, um, we have a lot of our staff lives in those SRO hotels, and I'm not sure, do SROs exist? I mean, some fashion of them exist all over the nation, but does, does everyone call them SROs? Do we, that everyone understands what that is? Um, <clears throat> but a lot of our, our staff live in those SRO hotels or in these like new um, navigation centers, one step out of homelessness, uh, homeless shelter thing, kinda. I'm not exactly sure how to explain them, but because they are staff here, they have been able to do a lot of um, sort of secondary syringe exchange uh, programs out of either their room or their bunk. <laughs> and uh, I've gotten to talk with a lot of the people who managed either their building or their, um, or their navigation center to approve of 
uh, secondary syringe services. Um, and so that's been, that's been really nice, I guess. So our, our team, or our staff is really connected um, that way into our city. So we've been, yeah, we've been able to touch um, spots that we haven't been able to touch before because of where people, where our staff is sleeping. Um, yeah, so that's been really nice. So I guess my, my answer is like hire people who, um, hire people from the community and then have them give out syringes where they go to sleep. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, Roxy asked, what strategies are people using um, with the increased use of fentanyl? And if you're providing fentanyl strips, where is that funding coming from? And were there legal and policy changes necessary to provide fentanyl strips in light of the paraphernalia laws? Are any panelists um, distributing fentanyl test strips and want to chime in? Cancel? We are. We've we've always distributed fentanyl testing strips. Uh, however, our supply in Miami is, you know, almost unadulterated fentanyl, unfortunately. So it does. They don't have that much utility uh, here, and I think in a, a lot of places. But that was one thing. And in places that still do have heroin, we we do advocate for the use of fentanyl testing strips. In terms of their consideration as paraphernalia, we have not run into that that issue here in Miami. Luckily, but again, a lot of things that are happening now, we're not running into issues because people aren't really paying attention. But when they need, when they go back to needing people to, to bully, certainly they will resume to, to bullying our, our programs. As, as we've seen in many cities, I mean, the number of sweeps of homeless encampments that have occurred during COVID uh, it has been remarkable here in Miami. And I've been seeing that occur across the country. So. Um, I'm not exactly sure with the paraphernalia policies uh, nationwide, but I, I would encourage the, their use. Thank you. Uh, William Mass and certainly you can reach out to, oh, sorry, Mary. I was just gonna say that certainly like you should feel free to um, reach out to DPA. You can contact me directly if you have questions about your specific jurisdiction, we can answer um, those questions with respect to paraphernalia laws and um, drop you up an ordinance or, a, um, or legislation that could address it. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. Um, next, I was going to go to one that came in kind of late. Um, what more should be done to include people of color that are healing, centered healing rather, into harm reduction? Can you do read it one more time? <laughs> Certainly. Can. What more should be done to better include uh, people of color centered healing into harm reduction? Andrea, do you have any thoughts around this? Sure. I mean, I think, again, just to expand on what I said earlier, right, is that, you know, we're still kind of in the process as in every single institution with kind of coming to terms with the fact that, be, you know, people of color, Indigenous people, Black, Indigenous, uh, Latinx people have been systematically excluded from leadership positions. And so, again, there are so many um, so many sort of modalities out there. So I think to other people's points, you know, this this moment again of sort of what is our what is our national agenda at this moment in history right now in terms of working within harm reduction and and sort of thinking through, you know, what are what are sort of systems that have been in place for generations um, that have functioned in the same way as now we sort of think as part and parcel of the harm reduction movement. So it's just sort of thinking about promotoras in Latinx communities where, you know, community health outreach workers, largely women, um, has been kind of an intergenerational system of care that has gone on in rural contexts, um, you know, and in urban contexts outside of the U.S., but that is very much sort of ingrained into kind of the cultural fabric of mutual aid and mutual care. Um, so again, it, it's thinking again that, you know, um, harm reduction didn't necessarily invent all of these wheels, but instead there are a lot of ways in which we can sort of combine what is best practices in harm reduction now um, with what we know are kind of intergenerational, you know, health promotion and, and community care models um, that exist out there. And then, of course, you know, the, the, the other thing too, right, is that, you know, as, as many people are being sort of challenged to be accountable and like show their receipts for their political pronouncements in the moment, right, um, you know, our commitments more broadly also come with a demand for money and funding and, and sharing of power, um, being willing to forego leadership positions if there are um, 
you know, leaders that emerge in other places. Um, and so I think those sorts of activities can have sort of real tangible results on kind of changing what we see as sort of the mainstream even for ourselves. Can I, can I add to that? So I, I'm faculty at a medical school where the dean is black, which is so rare. Uh, I can't even explain how rare it is. Uh, probably one hand in the entire country. But right now, the, at the helm of Harm Reduction Coalition is Monique, and at the helm of DPA is Cassandra. And this is an amazing time, and we should all be very, very excited to see what these two incredibly strong, incredibly just, incredibly incredible women have, uh, have in store for us as we move forward. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that shout out of our incoming executive director, and of course, Monique. Um, we are so thrilled with their leadership. Um, before we wrap up, I'm gonna have one final question for you all. It's, we'll just do a round robin and you can answer it in you know, 20 seconds. Um, and that is, um, you talk a lot about the community. We've learned about your incredible programs um, and the work that you're doing. And so what are you doing to take care of yourselves? Um, this is a real issue in the harm reduction community. Um, it's kind of constant stressors now more than ever. And so just a, a few seconds um, to end us off, um, no, there's a lot of practitioners on the call. What are you doing for yourself in this moment? Ms. Ian, let's start with you. Oh man, I was hoping you wasn't gonna start with me. Um, usually my answer is like, I love naps and baths. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I would say, um, yeah, it's good. It's a good start. Um, I am, I am learning. I'm like a, how would I say this? I have not been doing a great job as of as recently. And mostly it was because of, like I talked about at the beginning of our talk that we had, there was this uptick in, I don't know, it's like just, just elevated, I, whatever. People were just on edge all the time. And so I had spent all day sort of deescalating everything and not thinking about how much energy that takes. So I'm in my own little process at the moment that I kind of realized I was doing that. It was taking a lot out of me and uh, more than I had realized. And then I became overly stressed and uh, it caused me like some anxiety. And, and so I know a lot of people are going through this at the, at the moment. So I don't know, I guess maybe my answer should be like, as I'm in my own process to be like, I guess do some self-reflection and realize what, what can go, what can stay, work on your boundaries and stuff, right? Um, and then, so, and that's a good first step. And then, you know, second step is like, you know, schedule in those naps. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea. Um, well, since my cat is making an appearance, I'll point to her and say number one self-care situation for myself. Um, I also buy myself a weekly pie. Um, I truly do do that and then I disconnect and I enjoy a slice of pie per day throughout the week and that's my, you know, you have to unplug and just enjoy a sort of small pleasure sometimes. So I'll just, I'll leave it on What's that What's your favorite part. flavor? Well, there's a black owned vegan bakery in DC called Sunflower Gardens that makes an incredible lemon meringue pie and that was my last pie. <laughs> All right, Hansel. Oh, for the most Miami answer ever, CrossFit just on my balcony and not in the gym. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Jamie. Um, Self-care is not my forte. Uh, this is my needle exchange supplies that are in my bedroom. So <laughs> um, I well, would that say- Well, that could be meditative, right? You're no, it's bad. not. No, there's nothing good about this. <laughs> um, I would just say my form of self-care is uh, taking action. Thank you. And Jesse Lee. So I moved up to Western North Carolina eight years ago in order to hike more. And I've just been hiking a lot, a lot, a lot, like pretty much every day. I want to find some awesome waterfalls or some good views. Well, thank you all so much for being a part of our panel. There were so many incredible insights um, that I myself learned so much. I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, and we encourage the audience to please join us as we continue these conversations. We still have an additional three webinars um, and you can register for our next one, which is on July 9th um, at 2 p.m. on policing. Um, so very 
um, important in our current context. Um, thank you so much uh, to our panelists once again, um, and we'll see you in a few weeks.